So good afternoon, everyone, and um, it's wonderful to see all of you here today. And it's really an honor to be able to share with you the work that we've been doing this week um, in the advanced seminar. And I want to begin to uh, by talking a little bit about kind of how the seminar came about, um, and just you know to kind of let you know that this is building on things that we've been working on um, you know, for a very long time. And so the, the idea of, um, for this advanced seminar emerged in the wake of the 2016 presidential election. And a small group of us um, from the Association of Latinx Anthropologists proposed an executive session for the annual meetings of the Association of, um, the, the American Anthropological Association meetings. And uh, the, pan the title of that panel, the executive session, was um, Dissent in the Post-Truth Era, Latinx Communities Organize and Resist. And through this panel, we hope to do three things. Um, first, we wanted to highlight um, the unprecedented set of executive orders um, issued by the new administration um, shortly after, um, in, in, in January of 2017 that targeted refugees, immigrants, and specifically the Muslim travel ban that signaled what we knew then and has, has now been confirmed uh, would set the tone for the current administration's approach to migrants and migration that has a tremendous impact on many of the communities that we work with. The second goal in um, that panel was um, to, um, to really kind of engage with um, some of the media portrayals of the forms of protest and organizing that were emerging in response to the new administration and the, the ways that this was kind of viewed as something new and exciting and to, um, to draw attention, you know, as, Latin, as, as Latino, Latina, Latinx um, scholars, we have, we, we know that the communities in which we work have long histories of organizing, resisting, and, 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 um, and, in a, and addressing a range of different kinds of issues. And so these were not new kinds of organizing efforts in the communities that we were working with. And so we wanted to draw attention to those longer histories. And finally, we also want to draw attention to the importance of ethnography, meaning the careful attention to people's daily lived experiences that involve listening, careful listening, or one thing that we've come up with this week is this notion of radical listening, um, in accompanying people in their daily lives and how these tools of ethnography are critical for understanding the complexity of, of Latino lives and communities and, and also we want to highlight the unique and humble role we as Latino, Latina, Latinx anthropologists and ethnographers play in doing this work with the communities that we work with. So these commitments guided, um, guided us as we came together to share our work, our frustrations, our fears, and especially our hope with each other this week, this week in this advanced seminar. Um, I'm someone who works in the Midwest. Um, I've done work in Chicago. I currently work in Northeast Ohio. And it's truly been an honor to share the ways that the current work I'm doing now on the new sanctuary movement um, and the ways that that movement has created bonds of solidarity among not only Mexican and Central American, but also Puerto Rican communities that, um, that, and, and that do so through faith communities, but also through other kinds of organizations and communities to rethink what it means to quote unquote, welcome the stranger, right? That that's part of the um, kind of basis for sanctuary work, this notion and this need and imperative, a moral and sometimes religious imperative to welcome the stranger. And one of the things that I'm trying to document in my work is to show that you know, a lot of Latino um, faith communities and organizations are rethinking this notion of uh, welcoming the stranger to expand it to address um, the needs, for example, of um, Puerto Rican migrants who are arriving in Northeast Ohio in the wake of Hurricane Maria and the economic crisis on the island. And to really kind of think about their work um, as a form of, of accompaniment and radical hospitality that is capacious and broad enough to, um, to, to, to support both undocumented migrants as well as um, Puerto Ricans who are U.S. citizens in, the, in meeting their daily needs. So, um, so being able to share my work with such brilliant and dedicated colleagues that I have here um, and who will talk with you about their work has really deepened my thinking about my own work. And for that, I am incredibly grateful um, to all of them as well as to SAR. And, and, and I'm really indebted to their intellectual generosity. 
And so to give you a sense um, of kind of specifically the kind of work that we've been doing this week that builds on kind of this two-year conversation we've been having, my co-chair, Alex Chavez, is going to talk about that. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. So as my colleague Gina Perez points out, um, just to kind of uh, think through the history of this, might give us even more context is that, you know, this conversation that we're having has been two years in the making. Uh, and so I, I recall first approaching Michael Brown uh, at uh, of SAR when he came to visit Notre Dame. And uh, it was just an interesting confluence of, of moments and conversations because that was, that was in November of 2016. That was just weeks prior to this session that, that, uh, that uh, Gina mentions um, uh, at the AAA conference um, that, um, you know, after those initial discussions, the proposal to turn that session into a seminar were formalized in the spring of 2017. And so, I mean, it's important to note that with, within the context of these smaller conversations that they slowly developed and have culminated in this week-long seminar um, which has really allowed us to broaden the scope of our initial dialogue um, in the wake of that moment. Um, and so with that said, I, I want to mention a few of the connecting threads in our discussions this week, um, which uh, the colleagues here will expand upon uh, as they talk about their own work. Um, and so we've reflected um, quite a bit on our place in and relationship to anthropology. Um, as Latinx scholars that are situated in other fields of academic study. Uh, we do anthropology, but we, we're also in conversation with ethnic studies or women's and gender studies, American studies, just to, to name a few of these other intellectual fields. And so the question for us emerges, what is the importance of using the, tool, the tools of anthropology, but particularly ethnography, to conduct meaningful, publicly engaged research that, yes, crosses disciplines, but where there is something at stake? Um, and relatedly, then what does it mean to do brown Latinx ethnography, particularly as a practice of accountability where our commitments extend beyond just writing, but rather um, to the projects of social transformation and political movements that are central to, the, to what we document and how we document. So that's one sort of conversation that we've been having. Uh, Second, and relatedly, is you know, as we find ourselves in dialogue with Latinx communities, uh, central to our research is recognizing the other or others uh, as um, intellectuals, as theorists, uh, as curators, as ethnographers in their own right. Um, ethnographers of their own struggles uh, and social worlds, and this means uh, that it demands of us uh, something that, that uh, my colleague Gina Perez mentions, and that is the demands of us bearing witness to the experiences of communities on their own terms, uh, rather than just merely privileging what we expect to find. Uh, and so that means a kind of critical dialogue uh, that, that is central to the work that we do. Um, we've also had this really interesting and robust discussion around the cultural politics of belonging within the context which we can all sort of recognize right now is somewhat intensified, but there's a history of this that, that is pointed out. But within the context of marginalization, right, the politics of belonging in the context of marginalization and uh, disposability um, in the United States, such that we're concerned with asking really difficult questions regarding citizenship in its multiple forms. Uh, difficult questions around family and kinship um, and difficult questions about how meaningful and resilient communities are forged in the depths of political struggle. Uh, and finally, we, we've also found ourselves thinking about time and temporality uh, as we're considering the communities in which we work as historical actors in the present. Um, and this concern circles back around to this question of the tools of anthropology, to ethnography, and how we use ethnography to trace 
the horizons of intellectual and political projects of the communities that we work with, right? That those projects are ostensibly about possibilities of, of inclusion, the possibilities of inclusion, of social justice, which itself is about imagining a future um, that might not be quite in view, but nevertheless, it's about a future that is full of possibility. Um, and this involves attention to communities of practice, communities of solidarity in multiple ways. And so I'll, by way of segueing into my colleagues here, I'll mention briefly the, the work that, um, that I'm currently doing and that uh, I was able to, to be in dialogue with this week. Uh, so like, like my colleague uh, Gina Perez, I also do more recently work in the Midwest, specifically Chicago. Uh, and they're um, <coughs> exploring the creative and activist work that Latinx youth in Chicago do, particularly how they use media, um, specifically sound technologies, radio, for instance, to document um, their experiences in the city, in urban space, but in their neighborhood experiences, um, particular experiences and stories, uh, particularly am amid the sort of complex processes of residential displacements and gentrification uh, in the city of Chicago, right? The sort of how communities are in the throes of urban restructuring. Um, and so part of what I ask in that work and, uh, and continue to think about is, so what strategies and needs for placemaking emerge given these profound dislocations? Uh, and then moreover, how are these needs for placemaking reflected in particular sounds? And another question is, and then how can we understand those sounds as these aesthetic sites of democratic citizenship? So, you know, some of these youth that, that I've done work with, and in particular the, the project that, that I spoke about is a youth, uh, youth, uh, a youth radio group that uses sound design uh, to kind of soundscape their neighborhoods and document the stories of the people that live there amid, again, these, these transformations. And so, it to echo, I colleague that it is an honor to, to be in dialogue with wonderful scholars who, one, who I admire, but two, whose work is something that I aspire toward. Um, and so it's really been a wonderful dialogue to, to have. And with those threads in mind, um, I want to invite my colleagues to speak about their individual research and what has brought them to the seminar. So. That's my piece now, yeah. So I don't, do we have an extra mic or should we just use this one? We can just use that one. That one? Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thank you to Alex and Gina for uh, helping organize this and uh, giving us a space to engage in the type of dialogue that we're hoping to uh, really push uh, with this uh, seminar, but also with the conversation today. Uh, my name is Lucia Guerra. I'm an associate professor of Southwest Studies at Colorado College. Um, and if we think about perhaps the most ubiquitous image that circulates uh, of Latinos, uh, and particularly Mexicans, uh, it's that of narcos, of the narco trafficker. Uh, so I took this my study, starting point for my research, thinking about how we can uh, show drug smugglers and people engaged in this type of work as humans as complex individuals, in the same way that we would treat any other subject of ethnography. Uh, in particular, this is complicated by the fact that I, myself, uh, am from a border community uh, and a family of uh, individuals that participate uh, in this trade. And so, uh, the stakes for this are particularly high in terms of how I approach the research. Uh, moreover, you know, uh, when I moved to Colorado, uh, I was heavily involved in drug reform work and trying to think about how can we start to move away from the criminalization of this population through drug reform work. Uh, and so this was uh, what brought me into work in the marijuana legalization movement in Colorado uh, that I'm sure most of you have heard about in uh, national headlines. Um, but I wanted to pay particular attention to how this was actually impacting uh, illicit participation along the border but also the participation of Latinos in the larger uh, extended Latinx community in the legal industry. Uh, and, and what I've uh, had in coming to the sort of, uh, conclusion of is that 
even as we engage in the type of reform work that is vitally important to, the, to remedy the harm to the war on drugs, uh, that we also have to be vigilant about what effects uh, these changes are actually having on our community. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to reconcile in the work that, uh, that I contributed to, to this seminar, is really trying to figure out whether drug reform is actually having an impact uh, that it should be having on the Latinx community and the larger community in Latin America. Um, and if there's questions about that after, I can elaborate. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Pat Sevea. I'm Professor Emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I want to echo, I think we all feel incredibly grateful to be a part of this seminar and to be here in Santa Fe. My uh, work is looking at the movement for reproductive justice by women of color in the United States. And I've done research with 12 organizations trying to chart the social movement. And it's involved in different cities, uh, mainly in the Southwest United States. Uh, my paper for this particular um, volume focuses in on South Texas and the way in which the Latina Advocacy Network has been involved there going back to 2007. And in the post-election um, period that we find ourselves in, I've been really struck by the discussion, particularly in the press and by pundits, about what a novelty we're experiencing in terms of policies and discourse, but also uh, in terms of resistance and the way in which we sort of have, you know, the new, you know, chess moms and other kinds of people engaging in resistance. And part of me feels like there has been ongoing activism in many communities that predate this administration and are continuing and slightly shifting. So in my paper, I chart um, the way in which the Latina Advocacy Network uh, in South Texas which works uh, predominantly with undocumented, very low-income, Spanish-speaking women who live in rural enclaves near the U.S.-Mexico border. They have a lot of challenges to accessing any kind of health care, uh, but particularly reproductive health care in the current era in which the state of Texas has led in shutting down women's access to reproductive health care. So I chart this whole process of women gaining a political consciousness about their human right to access healthcare with dignity and the way in which that includes things like learning how to conduct their own breast examinations since they're not going to have access to a clinic, uh, learning uh, skills such as uh, submitting their testimony about the effects of public policies, uh, and eventually moving into open resistance where here are these undocumented women going to the U.S.-Mexico border when the president went to advocate for their wall. And part of what has been really helpful about the seminar is um, developing an analytic of poder, which translates into English as power. But what I'm trying to illustrate is sort of the multi-dimensions of women uh, gaining an identity as poderosas, as powerful women, but also recognizing themselves as analysts and strategic actors in the face of these intersecting forms of disempowerment. Hello, I'm Andrea Boliva. I'm a postdoc at the University of Michigan and also very thankful to be here with all of you. Um, I work with transgender and Latina women in Chicago and I work on their experiences in sexual economies of labor. So basically doing sex work, uh, which means uh, exchanging a sexual act um, for money or other forms of, of payment. Uh, so something the women said to me a lot was, somos una fantasía, or we are a fantasy. Um, and they said this to index how they are hypersexualized, objectified, and dehumanized um, in sexual economies of labor, but also in the U.S. nation more broadly. Um, so I've used the kind of seminar to develop fantasia as a racialized trans analytic uh, to understand um, their experiences. I argue, however, that fantasia also means a lot more. But before I briefly talk about everything else it kind of means, I want to emphasize that when women are saying this, they are being very critical about the ways in which they are desired and depicted. So I want to recognize and honor them as theorists that have very um, critical, nuanced understandings of how race and gender work uh, in the US. Um, so while it's important to recognize how trans Latina women are fantasized, and the very real material consequences of that. So for example, not being able to get a job in the formal economy, or being attacked simply when walking down the, um, down the street. 
it's equally important, if not more, to recognize that they too fantasize um, other ways of being in the present, as well as um, alternative ways of being, alternative futures. Um, so I ethnographically describe in my piece for today and a larger work how the women engage in resistant forms of um, working, caring, uh, making families, um, and creating space in Chicago. And I'd love to talk more about that in the Q&A, but that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ana Aparicio. I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology and Latino and Latino Studies at Northwestern University. And I, you'll hear it from all of us because we are really grateful for, to the organizers and for this space to, con to have been able to continue the dialogue that we started. I would say, yes, the formal dialogue started a few years ago at that AAA conference, but many of us have been in conversation about these issues for, for quite some time. And um, it's important for us to have these kinds of spaces to come together and think through the work that we've been doing. But more than the work is to find spaces where we can be creative, uh, be uh, to say what we mean, to say what we mean in a, in, in a space where we know it will be welcomed and will be pushed. And that's what we've had this week. Um, and so, anyway, my work um, has generally been about Latinos, Latinas, uh, race, immigration, and how different communities come together for, to create political spaces and how or communities, and how in so doing, they also transform politics in those sites. Um, and I have been doing that primarily in cities in New York City specifically. And a few years ago, I turned my attention to Latinas and Latinos in suburbia. And the reason that was important was that there wasn't as much work being done there. And I saw some of the same issues that these communities face in cities, also they were facing them in suburbs. And furthermore, in suburbs, we see many more different groups of Latinas and Latinos setting up home setting up community, so it's not just a Puerto Rican community, it's not just a Salvadoran community, it's all of these different populations coming together in one space, and so the project initially was about examining how uh, the, the demographic shifts uh, uh, of suburbs uh, between 2000 and 2010, many more Latinos and people of color and immigrants were moving to suburbs than to cities, we will talk about gentrification and how people are pushed out. Well, some of those places to which they're moving are suburbs. Um, and so, but there wasn't as much attention being paid to what was happening at <coughs> these sites, nor was there, I think, attention more generally um, uh, to how different Latino groups create community or politics or how they uh, construct a shared space. And so the, the, pro the focus was on, well, how are these demographic shifts transforming local suburban politics and public spaces. What emerged is a focus, uh, because of what I saw happening, what people told me was important, was how people in this particular suburb were using public space to create different forms of po politics and dissent. And in some cases, it does not look like dissent. Uh, it doesn't look revolutionary. It looks like people picking up trash or painting over graffiti. But that is part of a larger body of work that they're doing. Many more projects where uh, in the context of a very xenophobic and racist space that, ha that predates uh, the 45th president of the United States, but has been exacerbated since then, how in that context those kinds of practices merit more serious attention. That's, that's, that's me and my work right now. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Rosa. I'm a faculty member at Stanford. And uh, it's great to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you all, um, especially in relation to topics um, such as the relationship between ethnic studies fields like Latinx studies, African American studies, indigenous studies, and Asian American studies and more normative fields and disciplines like anthropology. Often, I think ethnic studies fields are positioned as ornamental or as sort of a, a additional sort of field of study that you could look at if you were interested in, but not as fundamental to our understanding of the United States and the world. And I think our, uh, in the seminar and in our work in general, we try to sort of rethink the fundamental role and the fundamental position of ethnic 
Latinx studies fields. Uh, as a linguistic anthropologist, Latinx studies has pushed me to rethink the construction of ethno-racial, linguistic, and political borders, uh, particularly the ways that language, migration, and citizenship are produced as particular kinds of problems for certain populations, such that the story that we're often sold is that if US Latinx populations would just learn English and migrate in the right way, then the United States would embrace us, which simply is not the case for millions of Latinx populations or persons who uh, were born and were raised in the United States, who use English as one of their primary languages, who might hold US citizenship, and yet still face profound experiences of exclusion across institutional sites like education, criminal justice, electoral politics, health, housing, employment. So in recognition of these kinds of endemic inequities, I really try to suggest that the problem isn't with Latinx populations who are unable or unwilling to assimilate, but rather narrow constructions of Americanness that are rooted in profound histories of violence and colonialism that demand to be reckoned with. And so in my work, I attempt to contribute to this kind of uh, effort towards this sort of reckoning by understanding the ways that Latinx populations reimagine the borders that attempt to constrain their lives, demonstrating that worlds beyond those borders are not just possible, but actually already in existence if we were just able to recognize and honor them. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Sharina Feliciano Santos. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of South Carolina. Um, and I'm in agreement with everyone. Thank you so much for including me in on this conversation and being around all these brilliant, wonderful scholars. <coughs> um, my research engages with questions, too, of belonging, resilience, and contestation. In the context of the mobilization and reclamation of Taino indigenous identity in a context where indigenous peoples have long been written as extinct, the Caribbean specifically, I look at Puerto Rico, Within this seminar, I have considered how Taino resilience and protest today is enabled by long genealogies and narratives of resilience and survival that long antecede this particular political moment, that mark the Taino as both historical actors and form the basis for their future forms of action in face of narratives that render their existence an impossibility. In light of this, I consider the diasporic networks, specifically in New York, of Taino-based uh, in New York City, who are key and have been key in aiding people on the island uh, through their Taino organizations in the wake of the disasters brought about uh, by the economic uh, abandonment of Puerto Rico and in light of what was brought to the fore in, through Hurricane Maria in 2017. Largely, my interest is to highlight how people work collectively uh, and sometimes in conflict to interrupt the narratives told about them and to draw on their own narratives, to set their own visions and paths for the future, while being aware of the struggles that they will continue to be in. Uh, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Roberto Rosas, and I want to begin my also like <laughs> my gratitude for the invitation to be here. We get the SAR. I'm an associate professor in the department, plural, of anthropology and Latino studies at Michigan, Illinois, and Urbana Champaign. I'm also a long standing member of the Association of Latina and Latino Anthropology, as we all are here. <laughs> what brought me here, besides the seeing my colleagues and things like that? is my interest in thinking through the practices of giving expert testimony, of bearing witness, of fighting for the right to stay for people who seek asylum. <clears throat> I regularly write affidavits and give testimony asylum proceedings of people fleeing drug wars in Mexico. My contribution to the seminar is called Witnessing in Brown, it is a deeply autoethnographic piece. It wrestles with the demand to represent homelands and peoples as monstrous, as demonic, and often, and often affirming racist and imperialist projections as a scholar invested in anti racism, among other things. And as, as I heard my, my colleagues talking to you, I'll say one more thing. I think. One narrative of resilience here is that, many of, many, is that we are here. 
And many of our colleagues had to quit the discipline along the way. And I'll stop there. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and the reason I'm so happy is not only to be with my colleagues here, but because this is my home. And I'm happy to see my family in the audience and my colegas and um, my collaborators. And I was told that I was supposed to go last so I could bring it all home. <laughs> <laughs> And so my contribution to the seminar was to think about doing home space or home place and hometown ethnography and what that means um, in a discipline of anthropology that forces us to go to the faraway field and neglects research done at home and often devalues the research done at home. But for us as native anthropologists, um, doing work at home is work that matters. It is our feminist homework. It is our perea, as my colega here, um, David Garcia says. Uh, he says that, to use a local metaphor, that um, homework is our collective tarea of cleaning the acequia to remove barriers so ideas can flow. The seeds of change can be planted and grow, and we can cultivate our fields. And that field is home. And in thinking about this, this is a collective conversation that I had with Gabi Garcia, um, with Gregorio Gonzalez, with my colegas at Somos Un Pueblo Unido, with my own family, with people in this town, um, about what that homework means to us, um, to build an aspirational future to build power in our communities, to document these histories, and to make them known. And so, um, in doing this work, we have a strong critique of the laboratory of anthropology. And that's not just the building down the street, but the idea that this place where we live, it was considered a laboratory, a petri dish, um, in which the entire discipline of cultural anthropology, American anthropology, was made. Um, through the collection, sometimes looting, of our ancestors' homelands, um, the collection or salvage anthropology of our stories, of our artifacts, of our ceremonial doings, and even down to our very flesh and bones. And so how do we recover um, from that kind of trauma? We have to build a new narrative for ourselves of what we are doing. And in doing that, uh, we can't just think about how early anthropologists made males with our ancestors, <laughs> to quote my friend Gregorio. It's to think about how our ancestors, how indigenous people um, created the field of anthropology um, by giving what was Indian given, right? What was given by Mono Mexicano communities. Uh, the coded stories, um, the artifacts that we gave, uh, the trust that we, we gave, and also um, in, our, in our work as native guides, as um, hosts, as uh, interlocutors, as people who shared stories, as people who gave artifacts. Um, and those coded messages following March for Shack's work um, were ways in which our communities, in some way, wanted to document themselves. And these materials are waiting for us to uncode them, mm -hmm. um, to be restored, to be repatriated, to be reclaimed. And this project um, gives us a more empowering history of our role as anthropologists, as anthropologotes, right? <laughs> who come up with all kinds of locuras, <laughs> which we call theories, and uh, try to um, come to new ways of doing anthropology. And so um, I'm going to leave it at that uh, with a call to anthropologia. Mm So I guess, yeah, I guess we have, I mean, like, yeah, we have...
you know, I think a good 20 minutes or so for questions, mm -hmm. right? Paul? Yeah, that's perfect. Questions yeah. from the audience. Oh, yeah, a, and can, that can be directed to, to, to any of yes, us? Yes, uh, Certainly. No questions? That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I've heard this um, before, but I can't really remember, and I just want to have more clarity about it. What exactly is like the being a Latina? Effect? I told you. Yeah. No, 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 no. There are people in the back. Please, if you have a question, please Go for it. yell it out because the people in the back couldn't maybe hear. Could you all hear that question? I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, so the question is what is Latinx? That's a very good question. Um, so this is so Latinx reflects, I think, um, a generational kind of shift and 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 pushing and reclaiming. I think going back to Aimee's work um, by um, you know I think people um, in Latino people who want to challenge a gender binary in language want to call attention to the problem of a gender binary and to move away from you know, Latina and Latino and to use an X to signal a more inclusive kind of politics and linguistic politics. And so it's, um, I think it's a term we've all wrestled with. Um, you know, we've had ongoing conversations about Latinx versus Latina versus Latino versus Latinoa. I mean, there's a whole range of different ways in which we call ourselves. Um, but one thing that I think for me is important is I think you know, going back to this idea of really kind of honoring and taking seriously kind of people's, um, you know, uh, attempts to theorize and, 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 and to um, lay claim to their identities is to think of Latinx amid a range of different ways in which communities identify themselves. And so sometimes people will identify themselves regionally as Tejano, Nuevo Mexicano, you know, New Yorican, Puerto Rican, Boricua, you know, Centroamericano, a whole bunch of different ways. And I think Latinx is a it's probably the most recent way, I think, in which, you know, um, gender queer and gender nonconforming and, and others are trying to push us to think about those within, um, within Latino studies and communities. So, Does, so is it, 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 it involves the, um, the Spanish language, but it includes all Central America or Latin America, or it's just the whole picture with the Spanish language? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and that's a good. I just follow. That's a good point because understanding this range of terms, a lot of it is sort of this wrestling with the politics of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So. And how do you how do you call people you know who yeah. come from such a broad range of experiences? How do you come mm -hmm. up with a term to capture that diversity? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for your, for your, I mean, your incredible presentations. I'm so excited to, to read it. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm really interested to hear, and maybe as a collective, or rather, I don't know if, you, if the, the editors kind of want to take, take it, but I guess one of the things that has me uh, really curious about this particular conversation is how, for example, uh, you know, Jose Esteban, Esteban Munoz's work with, you know, uh, disidentification, but particularly how Latinidad operates within the U.S. national affect, right? And how, uh, you know, he, he talks about it as off-white. And so I guess what I'm, what I'm really curious to, to consider is how, I guess, in that process of U.S. settler statecraft and the ways within which Latinidad is, I guess, negotiating those kinds of political narratives as well as the, so I think, in, and in many cases, especially as we talk about here in New Mexico, right, how uh, settler statecraft particularly works towards the dispossession of indigenous lands mm -hmm. in particular. And so how, I guess, within the context of like an ethnography of, uh, I guess, of, of, of dissent, if you want to call it, um, within a, I guess, within a critical Latinx framework is how, um, I guess what I'm, what I'm curious of is how does national, how do those affective aspects of, again, where immigration is talked about as well, you know, uh, becoming, I guess, a part of that affect. It's, a, it's becoming a part of the, that political space. And yet, um, I guess in New Mexico, where there's a, there's a whole different trajectory, how Latinidad, if we want to think about Latinidad, but like how those, those narratives are, I guess, are not as uh, flat as we like to think about them. So uh, I guess where I'm, where I'm wanting to, to consider is how within a space of Latinidad, um, where, where does, I guess, the, the, the impact of US settler statecraft uh, and how, does, how do those 
uh, how do those narratives uh, operate within a, uh, I guess within a critical context as you all, as you all are trying to, to consider here? So I don't, yeah, I know it's a very broad question and maybe something that is more of a dissertation, but, um, yeah. <laughs> but again, I, but I, I think it's at least something to, at least to consider, especially again, we're, we're here in New Mexico and we're here on, uh, on public lands and so mm -hmm. I think we have a responsibility to at least to acknowledge the complexity of where that thing got, I think, engages those kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I'm going to turn this to my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think part of what we've been trying to think about in terms of locating questions surrounding Latinx identities and Latinidad in relation to broader sorts of uh, ethno-racial positions and also right struggles is to sort of say, yes, there is, insofar as Latinidad is often constructed in relation to imagined narratives around migration, that the idea is to be included into a nation of immigrants, which then, of course, erases the sort of settler colonial history of the United States and also the history of enslavement in the United States. And so I think part of what we've been trying to do is to sort of say, wait, what happens when you locate Latinidad and the contemporary experiences of marginalization that Latinx populations are facing in relation to those histories of settler colonialism, colonialism and enslavement? So the goal is not to be included into a settler state, but rather to rethink the ways that that state has fundamentally excluded particular populations such that we would need to reimagine what that state could be or whether it should exist. Right, right, yeah, awesome. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm done. <laughs> I know someone had their hand up in the back. So the question is to talk a little bit about radical listening. Yeah. I can kill that. You want to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please. Radical listening. Yeah. So to the question, um, what we've been talking about quite a bit, it goes hand in hand with the idea of recognizing the other as an intellectual. Is it, so, is it all too often when the other speaks, it's taking in his data. We're really trying to, again, take their points of views, their testimonies, their stories, as analytics to draw on. So, in, in my work on testimony, when, when, I work, when I write, when I when I give testimony in courts, I'm often given maybe 10 minutes to talk to people beforehand. The first time I ever meet them. And I take that testimony as the truth. And I think there, there's a real skepticism in the court around what people who are seeking asylum are saying. But to have someone with the credential, it happened with the, with the social science, a term I really wrestled with at times. To have them say, no, this is true, is it a real currency? That's a, one example in the seminar of mm -hmm. taking the other, a radical listening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, do you, do you mean? Oh, sure, right, sure, right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, so I traffic in sound studies, so we, that's when we talk about that. But I, I think what, what Gilberto points to, I think, does capture, well, not capture, but it does represent really well the conversation we've been having. So, you know, my contribution to that notion in part is to think about orality, right? And so the difference between hearing and listening and the cultural distinction between noise and sound and how that, and, and John Rosa has done part of this work too in terms of language, like how we hear race, right? And so, so understanding that you know listening is not something that's self-evident, particularly within the context of doing ethnography and specifically with the kind of genre that ethnography often privileges, which is the 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 sort of communicative modality of like the ethnographic interview, which is you know not. Uh, sort of self-evident, not apolitical, not shot through with all kinds of contradictions and power and all the rest of it, right? But that's, 
the mode that we often engage in, because that's the one that the field privileges, right? Um, and, but what we're trying to challenge ourselves to do is that how do we become rather, instead, um, engage with and conversant in people's own speech genres, for instance, their own modes of communicating, right? Taking right, these particular moments of testimony, right, and that kind of engagement and the kind of truths that that, you know, sort of, that kind of engagement, what does that reveal, right? On people's own terms rather than, again, setting up the terms already, that, which is what ethnography trains you to do in, in, the, in the academy, in the field. And so, so rethinking that relationship involves, right, a kind of listening, a kind of critical orality. Um, and that looks different depending on the context of the situation, but that's part of it. And so I, I deal with that largely with respect to sound and urban space and migration, but that's the larger sort of context of me research-wise. But the, the real work of it is when you, when you zoom in and, and you're speaking with people and they're speaking with you. So if that helps. I think Anna wants to add. Yeah. So I'd like to add to that because I think um, some might say, well, this is what ethnographers do. They listen. And they listen to what people are saying. And we build our theories and, and our analysis on that. However, it was, it was really powerful what happened this week in the seminar where this idea of radical listening came through in all of the papers. But uh, I'll give you examples, and uh, Hiberto, if I may, um, one of the things that was really striking with Hiberto's work in, in giving, offering testimony in courts was that there is an analysis that he obviously has a critical analysis of the immigrant detention complex, of the militarization, criminalization of, of, of migrant bodies, of their lives and communities, but so he has all of that. But there's a way that had to be silenced because what he listened, what he heard from the people for whom he was uh, testifying, uh, offering expert witness, it required that he listen to that and base his testimony on that. And, and that was really, really powerful. And it came through also um, in, in everyone's work, but I'm just pointing out a couple, Andrea, where there's an expectation of what trans lives and trans politics, trans ways of beings, what, that's what our analysis is supposed to focus on mm -hmm. and what it's supposed to look like. But in fact, when she was hearing people tell her about and share stories and share their own perspectives, that guided the analysis, which is different from other work on trans Latina subject formation. In my own work, that was also something that I have been wrestling with. Um, when I began presenting on this work in suburbia, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was difficult to convince some colleagues that some of the work around beautification campaigns in public spaces, art spaces, festivals and parades, that that was as important politically as what might be recognized as, as overt engagement with local politics. Mm -hmm. And what they were telling me, especially some of the um, organizers of some of the projects, that yes, this looks nice, and yes, we're partnering with the local uh, 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 precinct, police precinct, and yes, there's that uh, co-sponsor or, or supporter coming from the town, uh, uh, um, uh, the town council, but this is what we need to do uh, to present a new narrative about Latinidad, about people of color, of immigrants here, because that narrative that exists about us is so powerful and negative, xenophobic, and it makes its way not just into interpersonal communication with people and how the yeah. violence we experience interpersonally, but it informs how elected officials then view uh, this community, our community. So there's, some, there's something important about our performance of self in public space, how we uh, take over and do things in public space, but that is a piece of what we do. <coughs> there, there, there's other work. And so I had to listen to that um, and, 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 and really center that in the analysis. Because for others, some of the work that they do, um, some, for some other uh, scholars, it might read as good neoliberal subject formation. So they are they're training people how to present themselves properly, uh, you know, respectability politics, but they're saying something else about it. And, and I had to take that seriously. 
So radical listening, that's a language I didn't have, by the way, before coming to this seminar. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful to my colleagues for that, but that, that's what I get from that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Here. I just want to follow up on some of this and ask about whether you've been grappling with the notion of authorship at all, uh, because uh, what are the ways you're thinking about in terms of bringing the people that you're listening to and who are speaking so that they become authors of their own words in some kind of public way, like co you know, what is co-authors on chapters in the book? But the other possibility is taking ethnographic, uh, you know, interviews and putting them online, the kind of thing mm -hmm. Stevens did in her book, mm -hmm. uh, where you actually are able to, to to see them as authors of their own mm -hmm. words rather than having to speak through somebody else. I wonder if you thought about that at all. Um, we haven't talked about that yet. Tomorrow's our big day to talk about that, so that's a wonderful suggestion. Um, I don't know if anyone... Yeah, that's such a great and important question, and my answer is going to like somehow, I'm going to actually contradict what I said earlier a little bit. Um, so as Anna was alluding to, when I tell people about my research, they often want to hear about like the activism that the women are doing. right? So I think that there's kind of this like romanticization of hyper-marginalized people. Um, and that was always really frustrating to me because as I show in my work, there are all these other ways in which the women are resisting. Um, one woman once said to me, you know, activism isn't just like shouting in the streets, it's also quietly taking care of a sister. So in my work, I describe, um, you know, for example, how the women uh, develop trans familial relationships. So I talk a lot about trans mothers and trans daughters. Your trans mother will help your a trans daughter become a trans woman, also get involved in sex work. Um, so I, I talk about all these other ways of resisting, right, that are not as loud and in your face and that don't seem to challenge the system as directly as activism does. And at the same time, I'm working with this activist organization <laughs> called the trans Latina Coalition. Um, and they're using the data to write, we're co-writing a report that they gave me to their activism to show what it's like to be a trans Latina sex worker. Um, and I think that's a, an important example because for them, they, they're not interested in being co-authors in academia. No, no, right? I understand that. And that um, what the issue is, is what's a format that doesn't seem like, you know, co-author a chapter, which is like totally irrelevant, but ways in which whatever there's, there, the words can get into, I mean, if they want, I mean, clearly you got the problem about, you know, anonymity or however, but people's personal stories being in public as their stories, mm -hmm. which they're offering as opposed to they're coming through you know, an expert or somebody else's voice or something. Yeah, great. I think that's where the radical listening comes in again. Yeah. Because I have to ask my the woman that I work with, well, what would you like? You know, mm -hmm. and this is the co writing report that they can use, uh, the Transatina Coalition can use as well. It's more collaborative where you know. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add that part of what we're doing is um, acknowledging the way in which people in the communities that we're working with are themselves theorists and writers and produce sound and use all different kinds of expressions. And so uh, we try to highlight that. Um, so we're not the only analyst in the room. And in my paper, I actually have a whole discussion of human rights uh, hearings that these women conducted in which they got up and they told their stories. But it wasn't this, this is my story we were literally telling other people's stories and doing it uh, confidentially because some of the women were undocumented. And so it was a so, whole social construction that happened. And so we're trying to highlight the way in which people are themselves circulating their ideas and what they're about. Yes. Yes, and I think um, the yeah, at least in the piece that uh, we contributed, and I highlighted the dialogue, that this is a dialogue that I've been having with scholars and activists, members of my own family, and that this theory, or these bakuras, or these conversations are part of our collective knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, highlighting that and saying that I'm opening up a conversation, that I'm, we're not proposing definitions, we're not making it solid, this is fluid, it's going to continue to grow and continue to evolve through our, our conversations and our dialogues. Um, and I think you know, that's part of sharing what has been called authorship or ethnographic authority, that it is a coalitional project and a collaborative project. 
<laughs> Probably one more question if we can. I think you're David, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I wanted, I'm really interested in this idea about um, uh, um, um, radical listening. And it's oftentimes, you know, uh, we, 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 we venture to say, well, within the dialogue, um, you know, uh, our interlocutors are also radically listening to us and, and what do our actions and what we do and what we don't do uh, often it, it, it shows what you know uh, what, who we are as as, as 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 participants in this discipline you know and and how do we go about uh, you know healing the, the past injuries of, of what our discipline has often you know failed to to uh, reciprocate in terms of you know they 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 listen to us plenty uh, but oftentimes uh, it's that 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 it's a sense of, I think, where we're, we're, a lot of talk, topics of talking about dialogue is that that dialogue is, is like there's, a, uh, there's different forms of dialogue and that, that, that listening is all, all, always part of that form of dialogue. But you know, how do we move towards like moving where ourselves have a responsibility to have uh, uh, into what the Norma Alarcón talks about is uh, this interactional dialogue that that we're helping build something together through the dialogue. It's like el hecho y el hecho, and lo hecho es lo que es lo que es el lo futuro, no? Lo que estamos construyendo es el puente, no? And that I think is uh, a sense that um, that as uh, as participants in, in, in our field, that uh, um, that. Uh, um, that, that listening is such an important thing, and I'm really thankful for the, that I've got to have a new, uh, new, uh, new ways of looking at the, the listening to, to today's talk. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think just one quick point to that is that it, it um, that that what a wonderful comment because you know to to degrees that understanding sort of building something through that dialogue is also recognition that. You know, context isn't something that exists out there, right? It's being co-constituted through the engagement, one, right? And two, to your point, um, it's then a recognition of that engagement as intersubjective as opposed to objectifying. And nothing to, 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 to get the difference in terms of a kind of listening, right? Um, so, but thank you for that. And Paul, I guess, yeah, are we... Well, it's a I had a question, but uh, you know, I mean, please. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your presentation. The, one, the thing that struck me most overall is that you all resisted just being reactive to the current political moment, and I was a little surprised by that, to be completely honest. I expected more uh, focus on that on the current political moment, and I think, and so the. The question I would ask you, and it's a very general one, is do you think that there's a particular relationship between the concept of radical listening and the ability to then not become reactive? Because I do think becoming reactive as scholars to a political moment, especially in a process, as you know, of writing a, an edited book, which eventually gets published long, hopefully long after the current political moment is over, uh, is, is not necessarily going to serve in the long run the goals that we all have. And so the, that, that relate, what it would be that, what, can you theorize the relationship, the particulars of the relationship between a method of rapid listening and an ability to, to look beyond a particular intense political model? I mean, that's a conversation we've been having for a long time. And I think um, going back to the kind of initial seeds for this, um, for this seminar, was um, a recognition that we don't have to be reactive because we've been living this for a very long time. And the communities that we've been working with have been living this in, a very, in it for a very long time. And that's not to say that there aren't new manifestations of this. I'm thinking a lot about the work that Santiago shared with us. You know, that, you know, it's not to say that there's not a newness here, but you know, there's not, you know, the, the newness isn't that, you know, didn't begin in 2016. Like these are long histories that I think you eloquently pointed out to as well that, that predate even the work that we've been doing. And so I think that that is part of what contains the reactivity. 
Um, but it's also what drives us to kind of highlight those histories because the fact that so many people were surprised is a surprise. Well, it's not a really a surprise, but it's distressing, right? Because that means that somehow there are lots of people who aren't attuned into kind of different landscapes of you know precarity, misery, <laughs> struggle, and resistance, right? So I think that that is part of what you know contains part of that kind of reactive impulse that I think uh, we sometimes see among, you know in the broader kind of political and academic landscape. Questions? Well, I, think, I think we will have to continue the conversation uh, privately, but please join me in thanking the co chairs for organizing.